So what we're going to do for the next hour or so really is just do, I'll describe it as a romp through the world of, of blue mussels. Now I should say at the start that I am a marine ecologist but I'm not a, um, a purely a blue mussel expert. So this is very much an aggregation of expertise and knowledge from a, a huge range of scientists from Scotland and indeed across the world. Um, so I, I claim no credit for doing most of this research, but hopefully just bringing it together will give you a chance to understand a little bit more about them. Um, and really what we're going to try and do today is talk a little bit about blue mussels, their biology and ecology, A, because I think that's really cool, um, and B, because I think understanding that in a little bit more depth helps us understand where those pressure points are for blue mussels or where the vulnerabilities are and then perhaps why they might be declining um, and that's the second part of really what we're going to do today is explore a little bit about some of the reasons people think they might be declining um, we don't have a very firm answer on that yet so maybe that's something we can contribute to later and thirdly just talk a little bit about some of the possibilities of doing some uh, surveying that might contribute to some of the blue mussel research so we're going to start off really just talking about the ecology of blue mussels um, and that's a little bit of a getting to know you session on, on what these these species are because I think they tend to be um, quite familiar to a lot of people but also very overlooked it's just something we're kind of used to growing up with um, but they're far more interesting than I think their uh, quite simple exterior might show so let's start off talking about everything mussel um, Actually, they're one of the most well-studied marine species, marine is a tidal sessile species. Um, and the main reason for that, you can probably guess, is because they're tasty. Uh, the real reason that humans do anything is because we like to eat it, if at all possible. So mussels um, have actually been consumed, as far as we know, for most of human history. We actually find them not only in the UK, but in America and Native American um, fisheries, exploited to major fisheries, but they are particularly a, a major European thing that people have been eating. The one thing I find really interesting, um, I'm not sure if any of you are, are from Aberdeenshire originally, but they've been hugely important here in Scotland. And we found that from some of the archaeological evidence. So this picture here is from the sands of Forvey, Aberdeenshire, and there was a, a big archaeological excavation around 2010. Where they found a huge shell midden so huge numbers of basically discarded mussel shells and they excavated down to try and find kind of like going through the layers of archaeology to understand what people were doing back um, at the time that this was created and actually they found that there are about three meters worth of shell deposits when you start digging through this midden and that included not just discarded shells um, but they found a charcoal deposit which show that there was a fire pit. So basically they think they've been steaming mussels um, for quite a long time as part of eating them. Um, and there are also some nice little kind of understanding human touches. So things like there seem to be some stacked mussel shells very intentionally. Um, it suggests that it might actually be just playing with them, kids playing with them, or even just some art as they're trying to, to use them in a way. So I think what was interesting to me is that the dates they were suggesting from the charcoal layer were about 325 to 555 AD. I'm sorry if you can hear a strange noise. That's my dog who's asleep and chasing squirrels in his um, in his dreams there. So if there's a strange whimpering noise, it's not me, I promise. Um, okay, so yeah, so really, really early, kind of 500 AD um, that they were eating mussels, which I think shows not only that we've been eating mussels for a very long time, but that they've been incredibly important you know, that the sea as a, as a protein source has been incredibly important across Scotland. Um, and so it's, it's something we've been thinking about and, and learning about and knowing about for a really long time. Now, of course, we haven't just been harvesting them for food. Uh, we've also been growing them. So I wonder, does anyone know what, what this picture is of? I'm sure some of you are actually uh, much more specialist aquaculturists than, than I am. Is that familiar to anybody? You're looking mildly blank at me which which is that's good that's good that means I'm telling you new things otherwise, I, otherwise there's not much point me being here um, so these are actually uh busho so they are what we call mitoliculture so they're growing mussels on these wooden posts um, so this is you know now we have quite 
it's quite sophisticated way of the growing muscle and understanding of, of the sea chemistry etc um but at the time this dates back to kind of medieval culture they found they could put posts in the uh particularly on kind of sediment shores um you get mussels landing there growing there and then you could harvest them much more easily now actually this is um it is called Bouchot, so it's a very French associated, we tend to associate that kind of thing with um, particularly kind of uh, Mont Saint-Michel, Normandy region of France. There is some, uh, I'm not sure if it's anecdotal evidence, but there is some evidence that actually um, this kind of method of cult cultivating mussels might have come after a uh, shipped wrecked Scotsman ran aground um, in the, uh, the Bay d'Igon in 1235. Now, I don't know if this is true, but the anecdote goes that he decided he wanted to stay in France, having been shipwrecked from Scotland, which is, I guess, fair enough, um, but wanted to hunt seabirds for a living, which is what he used to do back over here. So try to do that. He drove wooden poles into the ground near the coast and stretched nets between them to try and capture seabirds. What he found actually was that mussels began growing on the posts because he was providing them with a substrate to grow on. And after time, he realized it was more profitable to raise shellfish than it was to hunt birds. And thus it was born. Um, so we like to claim that we started it here in Scotland, even though the French are doing a much better job of it right now. But uh, take that as you will. So, of course, what I'm trying to say is that mussels are incredibly important to Scotland. You know, we think about them. Um, if we think about them at all, I guess, it's just very much part of our biodiversity, but they're very linked to our history as well as of our environment. Um, and although we eat mussels today, um, we don't eat a huge amount compared to the rest of Europe. The biggest kind of consumers and, and producers are Spain and France and Italy. So they're monitoring their mussel populations, particularly their grown mussel populations, much more than perhaps we are. Um, but what it, has shown is that the amount of mussels that are produced and are eaten have declined from about 750,000 tonnes in the 1990s to about 550,000 tonnes in the past couple of years. But there's a question there about whether that's because people are choosing not to eat them and so there's not a, not a demand or whether there's a decreasing supply and this is due to the decline of mussels and perhaps they're just becoming less available. So that's kind of the question of, of, of why we're here today is, is understanding why these kind of trends are happening. And of course, we're not just looking at, at eating mussels, but sometimes understanding the, um, the kind of market behind things helps us become a first line of offence in identifying what's going on. So let's talk a little bit more about them in terms of biology rather than just the history. Um, when I'm talking about blue mussels, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to be using the scientific name Mytilus edulis. Um, hopefully that's familiar to some of you, the kind of understanding of scientific names. Um, but whatever you want to call it is entirely fine by me. Um, so it's also known as the common mussel, or you might know it as mool if you're from France. Um, I wonder if there's a does anyone use a different word? Is there a Scots word in different parts of the country? Does anyone have a different term for it other than muscle? I don't have an answer to that question, so I'm just interested if anyone has anything else they would call it. No? No? That's great. And that's actually quite unusual for a find a lot of our sea species, because normally there are about 20 different names for it in different parts of the country. So this helps us nail down that we're all talking about the same thing, the same species. So. For me, I think it's quite helpful to understand the common name. Um, sorry, to understand the scientific name and where that comes from. So I understand most people are probably not from a taxonom tax taxonomy background. Wow, I find that hard to say. <laughs> if I'm not very good at that. These next few words are really going to um, be tricky for me. So you might not know um, how we can have classify things, but it's a little bit like decreasing circles. So at the highest taxonomic levels, it's a huge circle that tends to draw around most things that are living. And then we just do decreasing circles till we get down to that understanding of what a species is. And that really helps us understand a little bit more about it. And we can really classify it once we're able to identify it to a species level. So for a, for a blue mussel, starting with that biggest circle, um, they're in something called the domain of eukaryota. 
And that's the same domain that we're in as humans. That's pretty much everything that's not a very specialist form of bacteria. So anything you would recognize probably, anything you would see as a, as a living organism. So that, that's a pretty big grouping, not very helpful in terms of understanding what it is and where it lives. Um, if you want to take it down, you could take it down to the, what's called the kingdom of metazoa. And that's basically animals as you would understand them. Um, so everything from humans to chimpanzees to kangaroos to mussels all come under that, that kingdom of metazoa. But going down a level, um, we talk about phylums and we put them in the phylum of mollusks. That's probably starting to get more familiar. Um, mollusks are snails, slugs, um, and a huge amount in the marine environments. Uh, actually about 25% of all marine species are mollusks. So sea snails, sea slugs, um, so a huge, huge amount of them. And then below that we have the order, which is bivalves. Now that um, is an order of mollusks, and that's basically all mollusks that have a kind of squished body enclosed by two shells, that hinged shell. So we'll start to understand that by breaking this down, we'll, we know a lot more about mussels. Um, we know the type of animal, we know they're a type of snail or, or mollusk, um, we know they've got two shells. And then you put them uh, in a family, which is the marine mollusks, basically the marine mussels, um, commonly known as the true mussels. So there are quite a lot of, of uh, species that try and masquerade like mussels, but, but these are the, the ones we would consider the, the major group. And then you can break it down to the, the genus and species. Mytilus edulis, which is what I just said. Um, now the trouble with species is that it's very difficult to actually define what we mean by a species. Um, does anyone recognize the phrase, I know it when I see it? That's pretty much what most people are going for. Um, until you start asking difficult questions about what a species is, and don't, don't ever ask a biologist in the pub about that because you'll never escape again. The main problem is, is we thought we could identify species by looking at, at their, their characteristics. So, you know, whether they have two shells, what colour they are, and then we can group them like that. Um, doing genetic analysis of everything has completely blown that out of the water because it turns out it doesn't necessarily match our understanding of what things are when we look at them. So what we tend to call blue mussels or mitilus edulis, genetically, we call the mitilus edulis complex and that's because really there are three very similar species genetically similar species um, that are varyingly defined as species depending on how you want to break it down so genetically we can tell these apart in terms of identifying them probably trickier um, and if you're interested in in species definitions um they can interbreed so they can uh if, if they were in the same area could actually interbreed which makes it more difficult for us to tell them apart species um so really the part of this complex we're looking at the blue mussel the true blue mussel which is the one we're talking about um the mediterranean mussel which tends to occur unsurprisingly in the mediterranean region and then the bay mussel which is in the kind of north pacific region so we tell them apart because they live in different areas rather than they are very different beings. So this, I think, is, is much more useful because we can start to understand um, where blue mussels are in, in the world. So the, from looking at the genetics of them, um, it looks like the, the, the early origins of, of the mussel complex arose actually in the North Pacific. And then it's basically migrated around all these areas and has diverged into different genetic species as it goes across these areas. Um, so what you can hopefully see is the red is Mytilus edulis, so that's the blue mussel that we're interested in talking about, and that's the one we're really getting around the coast of Britain. Um, and the others are much more kind of Mediterranean based or in the Pacific region. So actually, when you're out looking at things on the shore, you're probably only ever going to find Mytilus edulis, the blue mussel. But I think it's, it's interesting to know that actually very similar species are all around the different coasts of Europe and North America. 
I think another interesting thing to note from this map, hopefully you can see this, is that when we find mussels, we find them in this kind of northern strip here and this southern strip here. Um, so we call that an anti-tropical distribution. Basically, they don't like the really warm waters in the middle and they want to be in the cooler waters to either pole. So this is why you get this big band of, of nothing in the middle there. Um, and I think that's really important to understand their kind of preferences of where they're going to live in waters. It's never going to be in that really warm tropical environment. <clears throat> now, in terms of their distribution in Scotland particularly, um, this is a uh, taken from the NBN gateway and it just shows records of blue mussels. Um, I think it might not show you every record of blue mussels that ever existed, but it just gives you an idea that they're pretty much distributed around every possible bit of coastline of Scotland, anywhere there's suitable habitat. Now this kind of map is almost inevitably an underestimate because this just comes from records that are put into this database. So it's not a comprehensive universal database of every mussel that's ever been recorded. Um, but it could also be misleading in that this is also records from over a quite a long time period and it's possible we've lost blue mussels from a lot of these places. So while this is interesting to look at and to see where they might be, it's probably not a very realistic interpretation right now of what's on the ground um, across, across the coastline. So what does that kind of translate like to on the shore where you are, where you're standing on, on, on the intertidal zone? Um, so blue mussels, Mytilus edulis, are called gregarious, which I really like as a term because it makes it sound like it's fun at parties. Um, it turns out they're probably really not. But what it means is that they like to group, if at all possible. Uh, they actually can be on pretty much any part of the shore. So there have been records of them living down to about 30 metres. Um, so the, the intertidal is where we're most probably most used to seeing them. But they can go quite deep subtidally. Um, they're most common on the kind of intertidal, just subtidal rock because they attach to the rock. And actually, if you're going to find them singly, you're going to find them tucked under rocks. It's probably very familiar to all of you who have been out on the seashore or, or rock pooling. However, what makes them really interesting, or really interesting uh, as a priority main feature, someone mentioned in the chat there, um, is that they're ecosystem engineers. So when they don't find an area that they think is particularly suitable to live in, they'll just build it themselves. Um, and they create what we call biogenic reefs. So that's reefs that are just built by animals themselves. So that includes things like um, tube worm reefs, if you've seen those, if you live in the kind of Solway Firth area but also uh, mussel beds more generally, and we'll talk about them in a second. Now, what's really important about these is that they are vital for the ecosystem functioning of that area. So if you think about blue mussels sticking together, they're forming this reef and they're stabilizing the substrate underneath. So if they're doing that over an area of kind of sand or rock or pebbles, they're stabilizing that sediment. We'll talk a little bit more about how they eat later, but that kind of mass filtering of the environment means they're very important in nutrient cycling in the area, they're providing that habitat for other species that live there, um, and they're also a food source, which I kind of talked about earlier. So having these biogenic mussel reefs is actually an incredibly important part of the intertidal subtidal environment beyond just mussels as a species themselves. So these beds in particular are listed as priority marine features by Nature Scots um, more widely. So some of you have said this is something you're looking at or maybe know a little bit about, but for those that don't, I'm just going to talk through some of the um, kind of characteristics of the priority marine features or the, the blue mussel biotopes that are currently listed um, under the Nature Scott guidance. So the first one is, this is, um, blue mussel beds on littoral sediments. So basically that's um, intertidal sandy bits uh, of, of various different sizes. So here they tend to be on very, very sheltered shores. And that's because it's very difficult to stay for them to build on environments where there's a lot of tidal action. So if you look at the map here, these are some that are, that are known. You'll see it's quite often tucked around sea lochs or areas where there's very little tidal action. 
a majority obviously on the like the west coast or the Murray Firth or the fourth Firth of Forth. Um, so there's very sheltered areas. And that's really useful because in these kind of environments, because it's very sediment driven, you won't get many intertidal species that are used to living on rocks able to live in that environment. So the mussel beds are providing a habitat for things like winkles, crabs, other species that need that shelter. So actually in the areas that they are, they're incredibly important for that biodiversity. Now here's the second of the four priority mean features for, for blue mussels. So this is blue mussel beds and what's called littoral mixed sediment. Now that's a subtle difference if you are uh, just looking um, for your own interests, but this is more sediment that is like pebbles, gravel, sand, shell, mud, can be a bit of seaweed as well, um, and they tend to form a very thin bed here among the cobbles. So it'll probably it'll look very different when you're out on the seashore, this kind of environment. Um, and again, these are probably very sheltered shores, and you can see there's, there's much fewer, sorry, many fewer records around Scotland for these. Again, a little bit in like the Murray Firth, the Dornoch Firth, um, but this is a much rarer type of habitat. And then number three, the biotope. Um, this is called re reduced salinity infralatoral rock, which is a bit like a band name, I think. Um, so this is the kind of area where actually you've probably got a mix of saline, so seawater, but also fresh water. So you start to get to brackish environments. So they're able to survive in areas that are perhaps less salty than some of the others. So can you imagine this again is some of the firths, um, some of the sea lochs, Loch Long, Loch Etive, um, some of the Outer Hebrides. So again, this is a very rare biotope, but Scotland probably has a huge number of them just because of the topography of our coastal environments. These tend to be kind of tidal stream areas, maybe down to a depth of about five metres. Um, these kind of entrances to the sea lochs mainly. And then the final one is uh, the beds on sublittoral sediment. So this is below the low tide line, probably permanently submerged. Um, and the difference there is important because you've got different species there, there that are living on them. So different species for whom they are forming a habitat. Things like starfish, anemones, some of the bigger whelks. Uh, they're probably much bigger biodiversity here in the marine environment. And actually this can be in much stronger waters because they're subtidal. They're not subjected to that same kind of tidal action. So down to about 20 meters. Um, and again, there aren't many of them around, but we know them from things like the Solway Firth or Loch Creeran. So I think obviously this will be recorded and you can look back at it, but um, perhaps if you uh, look through this afterwards, it'd be interesting just to see if they are if there are beds that perhaps you know about that are in your area that aren't recorded on some of these. Um, and that's where I think some of the kind of understanding of people's local knowledge really comes in, because these are very rare habitats. Um, and, you know, adding one more dot to that map would make a, a huge difference in our understanding and our, our monitoring of what's there. OK, enough of maps now. Um, I'm aware it's not the most fascinating thing to look at when there's just lots of or very few tiny dots. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a kind of blue muscle biology now because I think it's interesting to understand how they get where they're going. Um, why do we see these distributions and how do they move between these places? And understanding that kind of um, life history movement helps us understand where again particularly some of the vulnerabilities are. So blue muscles are actually separate males and females. That's something you might not know about them. Not easy to spot um, if you're looking at them. The word we use is gonochronistic, uh, which basically means separate males and females. Um, but what that means is that the males and females can't really get together uh, if you're a mussel. So the way they breed is by releasing eggs and sperm into the water column. Uh, it's not the most efficient method of trying to get eggs and sperm together, just throwing into the water and hoping it meets. Um, so they tend to throw about 10,000 sperm per egg into the water as a relative ratio and just hope that some of them combine together. 
um, it does mean that the kind of average number that are thrown into the water in a kind of blue mussel area is about seven million each season. So that, just imagine if, if you could see what was happening, um, you'd be I did, delighted or appalled. I don't know. It depends on your perspective on blue mussel breeding. Um, but it is something that's happening normally around spring and summer every year. So what they try and do is, like most species, I guess, they'll produce the, the gametes, the eggs and sperm over the winter period. They'll release them in the spring and summer to try and correspond with blooms of algae that come in. Um, and if it's really good weather and there's nice warm seas and there's lots of algae, they might release uh, kind of later into the summer, which is a bit opportunistic. So you find the same kind of pattern I would expect to see in that some of the southern populations in England probably are going to spawn before the ones up here, probably in response to the water temperatures. So to give their offspring the best chance. One interesting thing I think about um, mussels is that a bit like some of the, the species we know a bit more familiar, if they are stressed during the time when they're about to spawn, they won't spawn. So if they think the waters are too hot or too cold or something is wrong for the environment, they won't waste the energy throwing out these seven odd million um, gametes. They'll just reabsorb them into the body. So this isn't something we're really monitoring, but in lab conditions, we can see that they do that when stressed. So they might not be breeding every year or they might be breeding the same amount every year, depending on the conditions. So. Hopefully you'll find some sperm and eggs meeting. Um, they fertilize externally and they turn into an embryo. And that embryo very quickly turns into a larva. Now the first stage of larva is called a trochophore. And that is basically a um, kind of free swimming little larva, um, like a type of plankton. So it swims by kind of circling some hairs around and it'll go quite far through the water. And this is really important because actually it's, it, these larvae are a very useful food source for fish, for a lot of the things that are living on plankton in the sea. Um, and it, being able to move, having the capacity to move itself means it can actually travel quite large distances from the original parental beds where it was sent into the sea. So the distribution and the capacity to kind of um, that natal migration for mussels is, is really quite high. Actually, they tend to go through larval stages they can be in the sea for anything from three, three weeks to six months, depending on the conditions. So imagine how far you can get being in the ocean for six months. So it can be, yeah, it can be three weeks. It just depends on the conditions out there um, and how well they're doing. So after that kind of free swimming trochophore phase, you tend to get a phase called a villager. I don't know where that word comes from, but I think it's really interesting. And that's where it starts to turn to something more like a mussel. So it's still in the water, but it might start to get something like um, a foot. Um, it start to build a shell a little bit um, that are able to just look a little bit more like a mussel and starts to prepare for coming back on land. Then you get this villager starts to basically start building its capacity to be on land. And that's called a pedi villager. That's like a villager with a foot. That's where that name comes from. And that's where it starts to secrete what we know as the, the muscle beard. That's um, called the byssus thread. So what's interesting here is that actually they can wash onto shore and then wash out again as they start to search for suitable habitat. They have the capacity to, to not just settle on the first place that they land. Um, and in fact, it can land, settle, hold on with that thread and if it's not sure about where it's landed it will use the threads to kind of walk across the seashore a little bit to find a better space which is why you quite often find mussels tucked into crevices um, various different areas where they're more likely to survive as young ones by making those i used to make a decision but the, with, without the conscious effort um, involved in that now, actually, as few of 1% of all the larvae of blue mussels that are sent out into the sea will ever reach adulthood. So the vast majority are going to be eaten while they're out at sea. They're an amazing food source for anything that's eating plankton out in the ocean. So it's a very vulnerable stage for them. So very, very few of them will actually get to the stage where they'll metamorphose on a seashore. But those that do, 
end up turning into what we'd recognise as settled juveniles. And they do that by sticking to the seashore using the bissel threads. Now these are basically secretions from glands, they're a little bit like glue, incredibly strong, like we actually use them as a kind of um, uh, an understanding of how to make super glues because they do such a good job at, at sticking to a seashore, kind of bioadhesive. Um, and at that point they're either sticking to rock or they could be sticking to each other and building those blue muscle beds we we're talking about. And they can choose to do that. Now there's not a lot of um, understanding of why they might choose to aggregate as opposed to going on the seashore by themselves. Um, but there's some research that suggests if they're sensing predators around, they can pick up on clues of predators, so crabs or whelks, then they might aggregate more as a defence mechanism. So they have that capacity to be able to sense cues, know where to move and settle and aggregate, which is quite a lot for something without a brain, I think. And of course, this is what a kind of bissel thread will look like. So this muscle here is attached to a, a bigger muscle. Um, it's, it's made that, that connection with, with what could theoretically be a muscle bed or the start of a muscle bed. So what's interesting about this, this bissel thread is it, it's really, it's the superpower of a muscle. Um, it's the way it can attach to the, the rock is what's holding it on. It's the only thing that's keeping it alive. It can attach to other muscles to form these beds. It's also often used as a defensive mechanism. So if you are a dog whelk, which is uh, like, a, like a wolf of the seashore, wanders around and eats everything. Um, dog whelks particularly like eating mussels. They like coming in, drilling holes in the shell using their the kind of radula and then sucking out the muscle and dissolving it. So it's a pretty nasty way to die and I wouldn't be that keen on it either where I am muscle. Um, one of the things I like most about muscles is that if they sense a dog whelk in time and they can, they will try and tether it with a bissel thread. So they'll basically try and extrude one of these really sticky bioadhesives and hold on to the dog whelk. Now what you might often see on the seashore if you're lucky is you'll see an empty mussel attached to an empty dog whelk shell. And what's happened there is that mussel has basically sacrificed itself, it's tethered itself to the dog whelk, so it might not survive, but the dog whelk can therefore no longer move across to eat other mussels. So what's happening there is it's kind of a, a, a kamikaze approach to protecting the rest of the mussel bed. There's quite a lot going on, there's quite a lot of social, um, a lot of, of social happenings going on in, in mussel beds that you might not realise until you start looking into this kind of biology. So this is what it looks like if you are a mussel. Um, very simple in the grand scheme of things, but it's gone through all these different phases in order to reach this uh, pretty much everything you need kind of um, biological form. So you've got that bivalve shell, one side and the other, um, that hinge that holds it close, and then you have a siphon on one side. So this is the inhalant siphon, and it's the one that it uses to pull in water. And then you have an exhalant siphon that it uses to throw out water. So all a muscle really is, is one big pump. It takes in water, it eats anything edible out of that water, and then it throws out other water. And it can eat lots of things, whether that's bacteria, little microalgae, um, general biological crap that's floating around the sea. It'll take it all in and it'll put it inside the stomach and then it'll uh, digest it. So it can throw undigestible material back out through the exhalant siphon, but quite a lot gets stuck inside the muscle, uh, which is what makes them such fantastic um, filters, biological filters for the ecosystem. And if you open up a muscle, you're never going to eat muscles again, by the way, after this afternoon. This is this is going to be it for you. Um, you start to see, again, not a lot more um, not a lot more complexity going on there, but very strong muscles that can hold it shut. Again, if you've ever tried to cook muscles, you might see that, you know, they're, they're really good at holding it shut. Um, if you try and prise them apart. They actually, they're pretty much all circulating seawater. So about 50% of the body weight of a muscle is that seawater circulation, basically the blood volume of a muscle. Um, inside that shell, and I think this is 
interesting, that shell actually has three different layers. So you get that inner layer, that kind of mother of pearl when you see the inside of muscle shells, which is made of calcium carbonate. So that's created through a kind of like a, like a chalky type of substance. Um, a middle layer of calcium carbonate, and then that outer layer, that kind of pigmented layer that's a little bit more like a skin, um, which is particularly hard and difficult to abrade. So it's called the periostracum, if you're keen on, on scientific terms. Um, and that's a very specific protein that is used really just to prevent the seawater and rocks and things from abrading it away. Now, we tend to call the rest of this is, is mostly known as the foot, um, this large organ here. And this one here is where the, the bissel thread comes from. That's where it'll start growing that, that sticky substance. Okay, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, blue muscle predation. So it's kind of a video on in the background, if that's okay. Um, because it's not only us that eats them. Pretty much everything thinks mussels are tasty. So I said that most of them get eaten during those three to six months they spend as larvae. So very few of them actually make it to the stage of being a blue mussel. Um, and the most of the things that eat them are kind of like fish, jellyfish, uh, anything that's, that's eating the plankton. But once it metamorphoses into that adult form, it's actually still very easily eaten because it just sticks there, it can't run away. And in particular, it's very vulnerable when it is young because it hasn't had the chance to develop that thick outer layer yet. Once it becomes stronger, it becomes much, much harder to predate. But the main predator for mussels um, in most places that particularly in the kind of subtitle are sea stars or, or starfish. So this is what this video here is showing, is it's showing a starfish that is going up, I think what's actually a, a bouchon, so a muscle, a muscle pole, uh, and it's showing how it eats it. So what you're seeing here is actually a view from the inside of a muscle. I have no idea how they put a camera inside a muscle. That's not a, I don't have an answer to that question, I'm afraid. Um, but think of this like a muscle eye view, basically. And what you're seeing here is the starfish putting its feet inside, realizing it can reach in, and then it's taking its own stomach and shoving it out of a hole in its body inside to the muscle. So that is a starfish stomach that goes inside the hole and it kind of pumps out digestive juices and then spends one to two days essentially digesting the muscle from the inside out, sucking it all back in in juice form and then eating it. So as you can imagine, mussels are quite keen on not being eaten by starfish. So they have defense mechanisms. Um, in particular, they try and thicken the shell and thicken the muscles that hold the shell shut. Some of the research that's been done in the labs has shown that if you basically put the smell or the, the chemical cues of starfish around mussels, they start to build their shell thickness. Um, about 10% more if it, it feels like there are lots of sea stars around, just to make sure it's much harder for them to be eaten. Okay. Um, now I should say that there is quite a lot of research in this. This has been noticed for quite a long time, but there isn't a definitive answer. All I have for you are probably more questions, but hopefully this is this is what makes it interesting for people. This is why we're all here to talk about them. Um, and there's a lot there still, to still contribute to our understanding of, of what's going on with muscles. So we do actually have quite a lot of knowledge of muscles, not only because um, they're an edible food source, and so obviously they're, they're quite well monitored, but we'll also use them as what are called bioindicators. So those are species that we can look at to try and understand the health of the uh, environment more generally. So we use that for freshwater mussels, mussels, but also for marine mussels. Now they're particularly useful because they are sessile, they're stuck to rocks, they don't run away, they're easy to find. Um, they're very well distributed across, as we saw earlier, um, the kind of northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. And they're also quite good at representing the environment where they're, they're sampled from. 
particularly because of that filtration we just talked about. So they take in the, the seawater surrounding them and quite often bioaccumulate them within their own tissues. So understanding what's happening to mussels can tell us quite a lot about water quality in particular, or what's happening in the, the wider ecosystem. Um, in fact, every mussel, like an adult mussel, can filter about 25 litres of water a day. So they're quite rapidly responding and taking in what's happening in that environment. So they're used for um, various different projects. There's uh, something called Mussel Watch in the USA. Um, and also we use them as part of the OSPAR, so the um, Oslo and Paris uh, monitoring programmes that we have over here in Europe. So, which means that we are able to see something like this. So this is quite an intense graph. I'll talk you through it. Um, this comes from a Nature Scott report that was done by um, some colleagues of mine at, at SAMS, part of the Marklin program, which is marine climate change monitoring. And this looks at changes in species abundance, um, particularly compared to surveys that were done in the early noughties. And then these sites were resurveyed in around 2015. So what they've done is looked at the difference between the sites in kind of 20 hundreds to, to 10 to 15 years later. So these red bars here show the sites where the abundance has declined, the percentage of sites where the numbers have gone down. And the blue bars show the percentage of sites where the numbers have gone up. Um, and the gray bars are where it's just stayed the same. So we've got species along the bottom here. So there's lots of different marine species that are used to kind of understand it from dog whelks to, to algal species. But as you can see, the one at the end here is the blue mussel, Mycelus edulis, and it is the one that has declined at the greatest number of sites than any other species. Um, so over half the sites, they were seeing a decline in the number of mussels. I think that really stands out with that graph. You know, a lot of things might not be doing well, but some of them are definitely doing better than others. Um, and in comparison, that you, I think you're just asking about about US uh, kind of similar data. Um, they've done something kind of similar. So they looked at historical benchmarks and looked at, at muscle numbers over the past kind of ten years. And along the Gulf coastline, so kind of Cape Cod to, to Canada, that that area there, um, the reports they've declined by more than sixty percent. So in some places, they used to cover two thirds of the intertidal zone, huge mussel beds. And in some places, they now cover less than 15 percent. So for, if you saw that in species in terrestrial environments, if you heard that from birds, the kind of word that would be used is catastrophic decline, huge, huge decline in the numbers. Um, so I wonder, just so I can see a few faces. Have you noticed changes? Have you noticed declines? Or is this one of these things where you've just never seen that many mussels? I can, sorry, I can see you talking, but you haven't unmuted. Can you unmute your phone? <laughs> Hi, um, we've noticed in Loch Hun, um a real decline in the, in the mussels. It's, um, I'm not as, um, familiar with it as some of my colleagues at Friends of Loch Horn, but we've certainly noticed a big decline in the mussels. Fairly recently? Is that over yeah. the past couple yeah. of years? Yeah. Yes, recently, yeah. Okay. It's it's good. it's actually from about 2018 I first noticed it. Oh Peter, hello. <laughs> yeah. I've been here all along but I've been muted. I tried to ask a couple of questions earlier on but uh, you obviously weren't hearing me. No, sorry. Uh, yes, from from 2018 onwards uh, in Lahorn, particularly the upper reaches of Lahorn, although it's kind of all over the loch, but mostly up uh, towards the end of the loch or, or the east end of the loch, the rocks, um, the intertidal range, um, the rocks were carpeted with mussels and now there is none. There is, they just disappeared over a sort of year, year and a half. And now there is uh, there's none other rocks at all anywhere. Um, I've got some mussel ropes up there that I've been I used for my own consumption. Um, and over the last couple of years, there's been virtually no spat 
fortunately this year there's an abundance of it and all my mooring ropes and my muscle ropes are full of spat but it was late it wasn't uh, back in May it was um, at sort of September time before I first noticed it. Oh wow okay that is a big change and that's yeah. that's interesting that it's it seems to have been missing for a couple of years but then coming back again um, yeah. there's obviously some kind of source population that's that's changing that. Okay thank you that's that's really interesting um, I think We'll talk a little bit about the Enders, about some of the surveys, but I think trying to understand people's observations of this is going to be so important because you say it can just be one or two years. There's been such a huge difference and obviously things aren't monitored that regularly um, in terms of the, the kind of scientific pro project. So. <clears throat> OK, I'm going to talk to you about what the causes of declines might be. Um, and what I should say from the off is I don't think there is one. I think what we might be seeing here is some kind of perfect storm of various different things going on, that muscles are merely the kind of uh, precursor to quite a lot of decline in, in our particularly our marine biodiversity. So I'm going to start with the one that most people always ask me about um, first off, which is, is it plastics? Uh, which is a thing that I think we're seeing in the news a lot at the moment. Um, is it the microplastics? And the answer is um, possibly a little bit. <laughs> so mussels very much pick up microplastics from the environment. There have been, some, there have been quite a lot of studies on this actually, again partly because they're a food source, um, but a study that I've, I've listed here says that there were about 70 particles of micro 70 particles of microplastic in every 100 grams of mussels. So that's quite a lot. Um, and that's particularly in wild mussels, actually. And that, that's across Scotland and England, um, perhaps more so than those bought in shops. So they are obviously taking up microplastics that are in the ocean. I think that was almost inevitable. Um, I guess the question is, is it having an effect? So as a human eating mussels, that's a separate question. Um, there's a lot of studies on whether that's a problem for you eating it. At the moment, I'm more interested in whether it's a problem for mussels generally and whether they're the ones declining. Um, understanding what happens to kind of bigger wildlife when it, when it ingests microplastics, you know, we, we see stories of seabirds and feeding it to chicks and things like that. Um, it's relatively well documented. It's slightly harder on something like mussels, um, but there have been quite a lot of lab experiments that look at how they take it up and they do accumulate it in the gut region. They don't um, very easily expel it and it can build up inside them. So they think what's happening, it has what's called sublethal effects. So it's probably not killing them um, straight off, but it probably is affecting how well they grow. And part of that is because microplastics tend to absorb other pollutants in them. So it might not be the plastic itself, but the chemicals that are part of the plastic that's having an effect. And it does lots of different things from um, reducing their capacity to hold on to the rock. So it reduces the strength of the bissel thread um, by about half in some cases, if they've got quite a lot of microplastics. They just put, um, they just have a, a capacity to produce fewer of those threads. It's probably one of the main problems, um, but also it stops them developing embryos um, and it can weaken the larvae. So it's not understood how what impact this might have on a population level, but there are lots of different effects that that kind of microplastic in ingestion has. Um, and if you add it up across all the environment, it probably is having a, a growing effect. Now, the other kind of follow on from that is that even if pollution isn't being brought in on plastics, there is a lot of pollution in our seas that can have an impact. Um, I'm not purely targeting the first and fourth here. Um, it, it happens all the way across different parts of, of Scotland and the world. Um, what I'm particularly worried about are uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, they're called PAS, which I think sounds much more cheerful than, um, than the full name, or PAH. And these are basically pollutants that come from um, refineries, oil refineries, heavy industry. Um, it can come from tyres. So if you've got bridges and a lot of cars, what you're getting is that the tyres kind of particles that are going into, into the ocean. 
um, and particularly from kind of urban areas, large harbours, even from like atmospheric deposition from power stations. Um, and these, again, they're just pollution that they're taking up because they're such amazing filterers, uh, it, it tends to accumulate in that, that muscle um, body. So it affects things like their growth, their reproduction, um, and can cause mutations in muscles as well. So this increasing pollution we're seeing um, in different environments is probably having an impact on their capacity to grow. Um, now the other, but possibly less um, obvious type of pollution is actually fresh water. So that can be as clean as you want, um, but if you are a marine mussel, fresh water is not a good thing to have. Uh, and there are some areas, um, particularly in the kind of estuarine regions, where the fresh water is getting more. And that's mainly because it's just getting more rainfall. Um, it's all being washed into the, the kind of estuarine environments. And that increased fresh water um, actually causes more nutrients and causes the kind of freshening of the environment, which affects mussels. Part of that is because fresher water actually causes, or fresher, the kind of nutrient rich fresher water, uh, causes more algae to grow that can grow over mussels. Um, and particularly young mussels can become particularly sensitive to that fresh water. So if they manage to settle, they just might not grow very well because that environment isn't right for them. There was an interesting study in Sweden that um, thought that this was probably one of the major declines around that area because the amount of rain along the west coast of Sweden has increased by about a third in the past 30 years, so a huge amount. Now, I don't know if that's a similar thing in Scotland. I feel like we've already had a lot of rainfall. I don't know how much it's increasing, um, whether that's having an effect, but certainly with that kind of understanding that it's only gonna get worse from climate change, it probably could be an increasing problem as we go. So talking about climate change, <laughs> as I inevitably have to do in these kind of talks, um, it's probably causing most of the factors that are causing muscle decline. And uh, I'm gonna start off talking about extreme storms because I feel like it's very fresh in my mind. It might be from your training for the last couple of weeks as well. Um, I think some of the extreme storms show the interaction between some of these factors because mussels are actually very well protected against extreme storms. Their capacity to hold onto rocks is amazing. However, if you're getting mussel beds on sediments and you're getting tidal surges or storm surges in areas that are actually normally very sheltered, that can cause widespread destruction of mussel beds just because they're not used to being exposed to that kind of environment. You also have the combination of uh, perhaps a weakening of their holding on because they're eating more microplastics because there's more pollution and combining that with some of the extreme storms taking them off means that you're probably, again, have a capacity for increased loss of adults um, as these extreme storms become greater. However, storming, probably not the major problem. Weirdly, um, for us, one of the major problems is actually heat. Um, and this is true for a lot of the marine species. So this is an interesting study looking at heat stress in blue mussels. Um, and I think I'll, I'll talk you through it a little bit, but I think what's interesting about this is that it shows you the survival of blue mussels in, as a percentage against the temperature. So obviously the greater the temperature that they're exposed to, so summer heat conditions, um, the much less the survival. So these hotter, drier summers that we might be having, um, and it may not feel like it's so much here, but certainly you've seen the stories of heat waves across Europe, um, is actually just wiping out adult blue mussels. They can't survive that increased heat stress. Now, what this graph shows is that it's not just exposure to heat, it's repeated exposure to heat. So if you've got day one, which is shown by the kind of black dots here, um, you might get quite a low survival if the heat goes up. The trouble is, is that come day two, which are the gray ones, and then day three, day four and day five, if you've got increased periods of incredibly high temperatures, the survival just gets less and less and less. They become less able to deal with it. So even the ones that survived the first day are going to be knocked out by the fifth day. So again, this climate change kind of increased periods of hot weather are the thing that's really going to knock out a lot of our seashore species. They're just not used to being able to deal with these environments. <clears throat> 
I should say that this is actually a lab experiment, so we're not necessarily able to replicate that on the shore, um, but we have seen mass die-offs, and this is an example of a mass die-off from the south of England that followed one of these extreme heat areas. And that happens in the ocean as well. So it's not just those that have settled. This is a graph that actually shows uh, survival um, of the plankton, so the larval stage um, with the warming waters. So the warmer temperatures actually cause uh, a much lower survival rate. So they're being knocked in the warm water and they're being knocked as soon as they get out. So all this kind of climate change warming is causing just, just a, a problem both ways. Um, and you might have actually seen some of the headlines that we've been having what are called marine heat waves. So that's like huge patches of warmer temperatures in the ocean that could be having this effect on our muscles. It's just it's very difficult to know what's going on when they're out in the planktonic stage because they're incredibly hard to monitor. Okay, and I think the major one um, that is harder to, again, to look at is ocean acidification. So this, this understanding that the ocean is becoming just ever so slightly more acidic because we're dissolving more CO2 in it, it's just balancing with the atmosphere, um, is completely changing the water chemistry that everything has evolved to live within. So we've been dissolving CO2 for many years in the ocean now. Um, the ocean takes up about a quarter of our total CO2 emissions, and so we're just shifting it towards slightly lower pH over time. And that has an enormous impact on marine species. Um, I, will, I will send this around so you can have a look at it in more detail. But basically, there's a huge, um, huge effect of that, um, partly because it's changing the environments. So you get more algal species overgrowing, the productivity is changing, the balance of the ecosystems are changing. But for species like mussels that are um, shell growing species, so those that have to try and build their own shells, that change in the chemistry has a huge effect on their capacity to do that. So basically they get very thin, um, very more brittle shells in these kind of environments. They can't build it as effectively. And that just has a knock on effect to everything. So I think there's actually a very... Um, interesting paper here that looks at literally taking like infrared uh, and x-rays of mussel shells to see what changes are happening under ocean acidification. Um, so they're looking at just their capacity to make functional shells, um, whether it's, it make a difference, it actually even changes the shell shape. So they grow rounder, flatter shells um, with thinner layers under these kind of more acidic ocean environments that are actually much more vulnerable to fracture. So when you combine those with the extreme storms, again, they're just much more vulnerable to being affected by changes in the environment. And finally, just that knock on again, that this kind of interactions between these different effects. If mussels are growing thinner shells, perhaps a little bit more vulnerable to fracture, they're then more vulnerable to predation as well. So I was saying earlier that mussels can actually grow thicker shells in response to predators and they're amazing at, at protecting themselves and they are, but um, this kind of change in chemistry just reduces that capacity. And in fact, it might be that the predators are increasing generally. So again, there's quite a lot of work in Sweden looking at why mussels are declining because there's a, a really catastrophic decline on that coast as well. Um, and one of the things they're looking at is is it because they have more eider ducks staying on the coastlines at the moment? So quite often on the west coast of Sweden, their ducks would migrate, but actually because it's so warm in Sweden over the winter now, they stay there. And every eider can eat about two and a half kilograms of mussels a day. So if you imagine having that many eider ducks that weren't supposed to be there, there over the winter, um, they actually have a huge knock-on effect on the mussel populations that are already struggling. Um, I don't have a similar study that's been done in Scotland, but obviously we have huge numbers of eiders as well. So it could be, again, just that increase in pressure from every angle that's causing these problems. Um, again, we've probably got an increase of shore crabs that are a predator. Because we're reducing fish numbers, it's increasing the crabs that are eating more mussels. Now, as an interesting kind of last note, um, I, I was showed you the video earlier that it's gonna, you're going to be seeing in your nightmares tonight. 
of sea stars eating mussels. There's been a bit of a natural experiment on the west coast of the USA where they've had something called sea star wasting disease. So it's basically they just melt like the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, it's a virus that's just causing their bodies to fall apart. So that removed the predation pressure of sea stars from that part of the environment. And actually what they found is a huge expansion in the mussel beds because they just weren't being predated. So it doesn't mean that they're the cause of mussel decline, but it does show that that very delicate balance between the predators and the prey species um, that is probably being affected by all these different factors. So the entire ecosystem is just shifting in different environments. Um, and it's therefore very difficult to understand why they're declining or what effect it's going to have, because so many things are changing all at once. So that was a bit of a, a romp through some of the things that might be causing mussel decline. Um, I wonder if anyone has any other thoughts, suggestions or ideas why that might, what might be happening in your area? What about chemical pollution from fish farms? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think a lot of the pollutants, it's entirely possible that it's having an impact. Um, I don't think there's a study that's been done that has shown a cause and effect. Um, but it could be. That's a very scientist answer, I know. Um. Can I... Um... Sorry, yeah. I don't know if you can see me. Um, I, can, I can hear you. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting because um, is there any studies going on on that, uh, on salmon farms and the impacts of the extra nutrients? Um, the honest answer is I don't know. Mm. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I would be surprised if there weren't because I feel like it is a well studied area or it should be a well studied area, um, mm. but not that I know of. It's something I can look into and um, try and find out. Definitely. I'd love to know that. Yeah. Because there's so many stresses going on uh, in all the ecosystems on the West Coast that, you know, there are some things that we can do quickly. And that's one of them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as I said, I think it is a bit of a perfect storm. So there are a lot of pollutants uh, varyingly in our environments that are probably having an impact on mussels. I think from um, from what, is it Peter? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, what Peter was saying earlier, I think um, what's been observed is that there probably is a problem in the planktonic phase or the spat phase. So and a lot of these causes are... Um, happening when they're adults so you know this kind of weakening of threads and everything happen when they're settled juveniles but actually what might be happening is just not getting the spat so they're going out either they're not releasing um sperm and eggs so there's a kind of reproduction problem or those sperm and eggs are being released and they're just not coming back in so it's it's probably the planktonic phase that's the problem rather than the adult phase um and that's much much harder to study what the impacts are going to be on that um I mean, it's a bit like, um, I mean, I'm quite scared by your talk, to be honest. Um, I really am. Happy Monday. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, it's a common or garden species in a way. It's a bit like bees on land or something. That's yeah. such an indicator of um, something really catastrophic going on, um, like a canary in a coal mine. And, and it's really alarming because I wasn't expecting to hear that. I didn't know they were in that much decline I knew that they were PMFs that were in decline in certain areas the reefs were gone but I didn't realize it was widespread I thought those were just the biogenic reefs but you know I, I'm really alarmed actually <laughs> I mean yeah, yeah I, th I think that's that's probably a um a reasonable reaction I hate to say it but I think it is um and I think the canary in the coal mines are good a good analogy and that's why we you know we look at these kind of things because um i think the decline has been going on for quite a while but does seem to be accelerating and yeah, uh, I'm, 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 yeah I'm deeply alarmed i mean is there any uh way of doing anything <laughs> i mean apart from completely changing our lifestyles <laughs> i think yeah, I think that's the problem is that I don't think it's been pinned down to a, um, you know, if, if it was a single cause and we could say, oh, well, that, that's something we can maybe do something about. 
but and, and this is just my interpretation from from what I know and my, my reading. So it could well be wrong. We're still developing evidence. Um, but I do think it is that combination, the interaction of all these different factors, particularly around the climate change and the impact it's having on our oceans that is causing these declines. And I think they are just, as you say, a canary in a coal mine. I think it is just the, the leading edge of what's happening. Um, so I think nothing less than whole scale change is going to to really have an impact. Um, I would love to be wrong on that. I'd love to find the one thing that's causing it and that is easily stopped or solved. But um, yeah, I think it's just part of a wider problem. I mean, I, I'm not just kind of wanting to attack fish farms on this call, uh, but there, there are a lot of polystyrene balls that go from fish farms into the environment. I mean, I've seen them myself on the shoreline where they're changing over the floats. Um, and I've always thought those have got to have a really terrible effect on anything that's kind of in the sea eating. Um, and those little tiny polystyrene balls are obviously well known to never decay. So they're there for forever. Um, and I wondered if there's any, um, maybe even some kind of link between that in certain areas that could be researched, um, because I think that's quite a, a worry for me. Anyway, I mean, the plastic, the microplastics is a very scary thing in because of all the toxins in the plastic. Um, so it's not just the bulk of the plastic kind of preventing the digestion, is it? It's the kind of the chemical input. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think there are endless projects that could be done, if I'm honest. I think there's there's, there's yeah. more research than is uh, possible to do in a lifetime. So um, absolutely would encourage you all to, to find a project and look into it. We'd be delighted to support that. But mm -hmm. um, I was just have... going to say, sorry, Anna, it's totally different from global down to local. I put right. a comment in the chat, but certainly in our local area, our coastline changed because they, they built out some Musselboro lagoons and on some reclaimed land. And um, so the area has completely changed, I think, in about the last 50 years. And our beach has just risen and risen and risen with sort of sediment, I guess. So I don't I presume that means it's just no longer a great habitat for mussels to get a hold of something and grow. Do you think would that be I mean obviously pollution is certainly a factor in the area, but that seems like something fairly dramatic and I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Does that mean we just have to give it up as an area that has mussels? That's a really good question. Um, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the area you're talking about, I have to say. I mean, I, I know mussels, but um, so I don't think it has to be just given up. I think if it's been very built up and the environment has changed, that's what's going to have the, the greatest effects. They're just not going to be able to settle. Um, if you change that, substrate that habitat it could be that you might not get them anyway because we just don't know where they're coming from and where your source populations are so that's a kind of a separate issue but there have been quite a few projects now that are looking at redesigning some of our hard infrastructure in the environment marine environment in order to make it more hospitable for some of the sessile species so it could be that and I think it's more of a long-term plan that because there are so many declines actually we're trying to find ways to engineer better solutions to the problem so find ways to make that that infrastructure yeah less less blocking for marine species um, so it could be that over time it can be re-engineered into something more positive but yeah that's a very much a long-term a long-term solution I think. I was just wondering whether the I thought I saw that it was 31 percent the the heat was when they started rapidly declining uh, I was wondering whether they might adapt to going deeper um, and because I think you were saying 20 meters was the, the depth and the reason I'm kind of paying attention to that is that we thought we had a blue mussel reef off reef which is where I live um, but it was at 30 meters and so I kind of gave up looking for it because we didn't find it on our first dive um, but do you think they might be going deeper than 20 meters or not is it that's worth a, yeah so that's a really good question so they have been down they have been records of them down to 30 meters okay. so my first point on your your specific comment um, would be to say it's definitely worth looking um mm. it's always worth looking um and of course the second point you made there was that um everything's changing right so every distribution at our, our, our 
common knowledge um, may no longer be fit for purpose. So what I would also say is it is possible that they would go deeper. I, I, I'm going to say I feel like there are physiological barriers to them going much deeper. I think they're more likely to be shifting range than they mm. are depth. But okay. that doesn't mean that that's the case. So I would definitely look mm. look down to those those depths. Um, but I think what we're going to see is with these warming seas with everything is they're going to be starting to shift ranges. So, you know, they're just not going to survive very well in the warmer, more exposed seas. If they're going to be going further north is mm. is the most likely. Whether or not there's sufficient habitat for them is a separate question. Everything going further north is anything going further south. <laughs> Seems like all the fish are going north. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everything's just going to end up at the top now. That's... Yeah. <laughs> Can have to move. <laughs> can, can I say something? The, the, um, the Mediterranean supports a lot of mussels. Is it because it's a different species or are they less susceptible to temperature change? Or, or you know, I was in um, Bulgaria a couple of years ago and there was mussel farms all over the area where I was uh, staying. Is that green mussels or is it, is, was it a blue mussel? So I think they're largely, so there is a Mediterranean mussel that is part of the, the mitilus complex. Um, so mm. they'd be very similar to our blue mussels. Um, I don't know if anyone's really tested if they have a greater heat tolerance because they're a Mediterranean species. I imagine they are adapted differently just because of where they've grown in order to be able to tolerate warmer waters. Um, I think a lot of the heat problems we're having with mussels is less to do with the kind of average heat, which is obviously a little bit warm in the Mediterranean in the ocean, and more to do with these extreme heats. So these flashes of marine heat waves either in the sea or on the shore. So it's those kind of extreme heat waves essentially that are causing the problem rather than the average heat. So actually what you might find is the Mediterranean is also experiencing declines because even though they might be adapted to slightly warmer waters generally, they're probably equally unable to cope with these extreme marine heat waves. Um, do, you, do you mean uh, they get affected when the mussel is out of the water or is it when it's in the water? Because the tidal range in the Med is much, much less than it is uh, around our shores. So maybe they're not exposed to uh, the ambient temperature, the, the sun, um, as ours are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a great point. Um, and I think it's a it's so it's a bit of both. Uh, so for the adult mussels, it is ex like time exposed and heat exposure. So it's entirely possible that smaller tidal ranges there are, are, are a protective factor. Um, but the marine heat waves are kind of uh, all, all also happening at sea and that's affecting them in the planktonic stages. So that's when they're just in the water during while well, they're larvae. So that would have just as much an impact in that region anyway but it could be they're just not affecting the adults as much it's a great it's a great answer okay <clears throat> i was wondering if you had any further comments on habitat preference for mussels considering like if you put a, a clean rock or one of those wooden posts into the sea where or what would prefer mussels to grow on it rather than like becoming alga covered i as far as I'm aware, they would generally attach to any hard substrate. So if they were there and the spat were available, they should settle. Um, one of the problems is, depending on, I think it's less the substrate and what the water's like where it's situated. So for example, if there's high nutrient load, um, you'll get a very filamentous algae that'll cover a post or a rock, probably equally, um, that'll prevent mussel spat landing because it's creating a, a surface that they can't attach to so I, as far as I'm aware it should make a difference whether you put a rock or a post out particularly it just depends whether there are mussels there and what gets there first um. thanks I uh, just have a couple of um, comments about surveys I'd like to, to make I'm aware we're running low on time so I would just like to point out a couple of things that are happening that you might want to be involved with um, if you're interested in, in kind of knowing a bit more or contributing to what's happening. So um, I think there are kind of really two 
two parts to this um, that we're interested in, and one of which is where are they? So I think um, these conversations about are they down to, to 30 meters depth, etc., really interesting. We don't know where all the muscles are. We don't know, I think, possibly even where all the priority mean feature beds are. So if you have an idea and can check that out and test it out and talk to Nature Scott, then absolutely please do that. I think it's important that we have a, a greater understanding of, of where these things are. Um, I think Maddie might have talked to you a little bit more about this if you're interested, so we're, we're low on time, but um, Nature Scott are really interested in blue mussels and collaborating to understand why they might be declining. So not only where they are, but where they were um, uh, and the kind of health of them. So this is a specific project they're undertaking. They're really keen to work with community groups on that. So please feel free to reach out if you're interested. They are a priority mean feature. We have been noticing declines. We'd love to know why, um, particularly for those that are on sediments. Um, so some of these priority features. So if you're interested, reach out and we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, in terms of those of you that have the Community Marine Monitoring Handbook, um, there are some techniques in there that can help you survey mussels that are particularly focused on mussel beds. Um, and that includes even just doing species surveys. So going out in the intertidal, the subtitle, finding out if we've got the species there and recording it, because I think that's, that's step one. Um, I popped these up because the one thing that we tend to get a little bit of confusion of, um, most people, if you see a blue mussel, that's that's fairly easy. It's a blue mussel. Uh, we don't get any other species here that we're aware of, so perfect. It's fairly easy to identify. Um, this one here is a juvenile blue mussel. So when they are laying down their shells, they get a kind of zebra stripey effect. So if you spot one of these on the marine environment on the seashore, it's probably a juvenile. This on the right here is a zebra mussel. So this is an invasive freshwater species. But as you can see, if you are looking through a guidebook for mussels, they look very similar. Um, what I would say is if, if you're in the marine environment, it's probably a juvenile blue mussel. It wouldn't really be a zebra mussel. Unless you're in a kind of estuarine environment, then it'll depend on the salinity a little bit. But just to, to draw your attention to that, if you're doing a survey, um, the nice thing about blue mussels in generally is that they are quite easy to identify <laughs> once you've found them. Um, there are a couple of techniques in the community monitoring handbook that are particularly good for blue mussels. So if you're involved in that or would like to get involved in that, I really wanted to highlight that to you. Um, the first of which is the habitat, habitat mapping. So that's basically drawing a GPS circle around the blue mussel bed. And that allows us to, over time, see if that bed is declining or changing shape or disappearing altogether. And I think that's really important because that's not just a presence, that's an understanding of what's happening to these beds. Um, Can I ask what, what constitutes a bed? I mean, if you had uh, some rocks on the, on the seashore and it was covered in mussels, is that a bed or, I mean, what, how do you categorize or, or how, what's, you know, what, what sort of numbers do you have to be able to call it a bed? Uh, that's a touch of, um, I'll know it if I see it kind of answer. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that there's a specific boundary. What I would say is the blue mussel beds, the, the term bed tends to be used for those that have created their own biogenic reef. So those that are attached together. So then they are a bed of themselves. Um, however, patches of blue mussels, so big kind of patches of them are equally worth mapping. So they might not be a priority mean feature, but I still want to understand, or we still want to understand whether or not they're changing. So if you see, blue mussels in a aggregation too numerous to count individually, I would absolutely draw a uh, a circle around that and, and call it some kind of patch and monitor whether or not that's changing. So there's a balance here between, um, I guess as well, what Nature Scott has a priority, absolutely, but also just monitoring what's changing in your local environment, because I think that's, that's equally important to be able to see what's happening there. Um, and again, as part of that, there is a survey on habitat quality, which might be interesting if you've got a smaller um, patches, because that's not only looking at the size of the, the habitat patch, but for blue mussels, you're monitoring how many empty shells there are. So how many of that patch or that, that bed 
are alive and how many are dead because that can make a big difference as well you might just have a lot of empty shells so that might be quite an early warning that we're seeing for example mass muscle death um, due to heat waves so that's something worth looking at because then you can monitor very quickly whether or not that bed is going to change over time by looking at how many of them are surviving so i would yeah definitely Have highlight that mass too as well. mortalities in scotland um in the last few years or is it just england that's a good question um i don't know if there's a a good answer to that we mainly know about mass mortalities when huge numbers of shells wash in um, mm. and there have been some so a, a few years ago for example there i know there was one um out towards saint andrews where a huge number of shells washed in they think it was due to a fresh water event a huge amount of rainfall kind of caused a problem in the sediment and everything died off um i don't know if there's been anything muscle specific that has been noticed beyond these kind of big mass events Mm. Um, one last wee point to make is that, you know, I think I've mentioned a lot about marine heat waves here. Um, that's something that's kind of growing concern alongside the um, more broad ocean acidification, climate change things. Um, Nature Scott actually have some uh, temperature loggers. So if you're interested in looking at impacts of heat waves, if you have a muscle bed that's intertidal and you want to look at whether or not heat is, is causing a problem, you can put them in the muscle beds and look at the temperatures that they're being experienced. Um, this is an interesting picture. This is actually a robot muscle in the, the middle here. So people have designed essentially temperature loggers inside a muscle shell. So it experiences the temperature that a muscle does exactly. And you can get robot limpets as well if you're what a new hobby um, but these kind of things are very useful just to understand the stresses are being put actually happening out in the environment so a lot of the studies i mentioned are lab-based where it's just easier to control um, and it's it's to be honest cheaper to do if you're trying to do it in a lab whereas if as a community you're interested in doing it in your local environment that would be fantastic information to try and help um, us understand what's really going on out there in the environment I mean, we would love to do that um, at some point when we've got a project officer who can handle. <laughs> We're overstretched by a long, a long, long way at the moment, but we would definitely be up for that. Of course, I think this is a problem for everybody is, is uh, being overstretched. But um, if there is interest, I guess I would say reach out to Maddie in the first instance who can um, try and work with you to find what, what could work best. Because um, I think, you know, this kind of thing would be really interesting in your area. But mm. yeah, it is obviously a, a difficulty to, to to put the capacity towards it. Mm, definitely. Well, can I ask uh, what low temperatures, you know, if you had a snap of frost and a very low tide, um, would you know if it was going down to sort of minus eight minus ten would that kill them off or can they survive that sort of temperatures that's a really good question now i don't know and doesn't mean no and i don't know of any studies that have looked at extreme cold um i think the assumption is that actually they survive much better the cold because they're adapted to to see temperature environments but there is no reason to say that it couldn't be causing a problem so perhaps something like temperature loggers would be really interesting to be able to see if that's if that's what they're experiencing is more extreme cold. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to mention with the um, temperature data loggers, um, that we could share with community groups. Um, I'd have to check if, if we've got more. But what would um, be really great is that you find a place that you know is safe, that you can go check up on it um, semi-regularly just to make sure that it's still there. Um, and I think my understanding is that you can leave them out for maybe around a year or so and they're just sitting sitting there collecting all this information um, and then you could send it back to, to Nature Scott so that we could extract the data from it and let you know what, what just so that you don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to, um, you know, use this data logger or extract the data that, that it is collecting. Um, 
And what's also quite exciting is that one of the groups involved in the monitoring project um, from the Berkshire Marine Reserve, they actually got um, robo limpets. Hear from them how, how they get on with, with the robo limpets as well. That's great. I love that people are actually using robo limpets. Thank you. So um, I guess everyone has your details, Maddie, in order to reach out to you. Um, I think so. If you don't, then um, let me know. <laughs> um, otherwise, you can find it on, on the project website. There's a um, email address, community marine survey at nature scott dot, no, nature dot scott. Um, I can put it in the chat otherwise quickly as well. I forget that that's there sometimes. That would be great. Um, and just, I, I'm aware we're over time, so I, I don't want to keep you too much longer talking about muscles, but um, Texa, you mentioned in the chat, would there be funder availability and interest to conduct restoration projects with mussels? That is a really good question. Um, there are, there's definitely a lot of interest in restoration at the moment. I don't know if it's particularly been done with mussels. Um, people have made kind of uh, mussel beds, but not as far as I'm aware around Scotland. So I'm sure there'd be interest in exploring whether or not that's possible. So absolutely. Um, and if you're interested in finding people to partner with on that then do reach out to me or to Maddie and we can certainly try and find people that would be in I'm sure they'll definitely be interested in, in talking more about it uh, as with any of these things. Also quickly just related to funding um, I think most of the people here already have equipment through the equipment fund but for those of you that don't have monitoring equipment yet but are interested in maybe going out and doing surveys whether that's blue mussels or something else or a combination of of both, then the equipment fund is open at the moment. So um, we're accepting applications on a rolling basis until funds are exhausted. Um, so that might be something that you might want to look at. And we can definitely have a chat as well in terms of um, if you want to discuss any survey ideas or survey plans, then um, I'm happy to, to do that as well. Great. Um... I'm aware people are going to have to start to go, so I, I'm, I'm keen to kind of wrap it up there, but I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for uh, A, giving up some of your Monday evening um, to sit with us, and B, for your kind of interesting contributions and, and details. I think trying to gather your your knowledge and your experience and your interest is going to be a really key part of, of our understanding of what's happening um, in such a rapid way over the next next few years. So please do keep your interest, do re reach out and try and um, get involved with these projects. And yeah, I've very much enjoyed meeting you all. Thank you very much for, for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>